بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات امید کرتا ہوں کہ آپ سب لوگ خیریت کے ساتھ ہوں گے اینڈ آئی ویلکم یو آل ہیئر ٹوڈے ٹو دا سیکنڈ لیکچر آف کنزیومر سائیکالوجی بفور آئی ٹیک یو ڈیپ ان ٹو دا پروسیڈنگز آف دا ڈے لیٹ می گیو یو اے بریف ریویو آف وٹ وی ڈسکسڈ ان آر لاسٹ لیکچر آر فرسٹ لیکچر اسٹارٹیڈ آؤٹ ود بیسک انٹروڈکشن ٹو کنزیومر سائیکالوجی اینڈ وی بلڈ اٹ اپ آن دا پرمائز دیٹ آل آف اس آر کنزیومرس اینڈ ایز کنزیومرس آر اسمال کنزمپشن ریلیٹڈ ڈسیزنس create big impact, so much so that they sometimes impact the global economies as well. We then moved forward to discuss one of the basic questions to the field of consumer psychology, which was, why do we buy things? Then in the field of consumer psychology, with the perspective of this basic question in mind, we discussed four important business concepts, which were number one, production concept, number two, product concept, number three, selling concept, And number four, the marketing concept. Owing to production concept, companies started thinking that consumers only need to purchase cheap things as they are interested in buying different items that are sold to them on cheap prices. So the companies started thinking that they must develop and design products that are cheap and that could be intensively distributed amongst the consumers. However, there was a flaw with this basic concept, which was that consumers' wishes and desires were not taken into consideration in the basic design of these products as there were many consumers who had enlarged buying capacity and they wanted more and more features in their products which were not being made available to them. The next concept that came in the line was product concept. And owing to this concept, companies started thinking that consumers are interested in purchasing only extremely refined items. So in this effort, they started adding as many features as they possibly could to further fine-tune their products. However, in this process, the products started coming very expensive, and a lot of times, additional features that were added were not necessarily required by the consumers. So once again, consumers' wishes and desires were not taken into consideration. The third concept that came in the line was selling concept. This was a pretty aggressive stance, and companies started thinking that consumers would not purchase anything unless they are aggressively influenced to do so. So they started developing the techniques of hard selling. Utilizing these techniques, they were able to cox their consumers into purchasing many different items that they did not actually need. So these consumers ending up purchasing items they did not need would always feel dissatisfied about them. And a dissatisfied consumer would not come back to purchase the same item again. At this point of time, certain people started thinking that why not make products that consumers actually need? But how to do that? A simple answer that came to their mind was to go to the consumers and ask them as to what kind of products do they desire and what kind of particular features do they need to have in their products. Gentlemen and ladies, this was the start of the marketing concept in which consumer became object of supreme importance. And all the production design and different features added into them were keeping one basic point in the mind, that is what the consumer desires. Then in the perspective of these four business concepts, we discussed about four important businessmen at the start of the 21st century. Those included, number one, Henry Ford. We discussed him in the perspective of production concept. And the next three gentlemen were Ray Cork, Alfred P. Sloan, and Colonel Sanders. These three gentlemen intuitively were able to use marketing concept in their business strategy. And they somehow developed different techniques that helped them implement the marketing concept and attain big business successes in their professions. This was the start of the marketing concept, an extremely revolutionary time period that changed the face of business industry all over the world later on. Students, today we will move forward to study the development of marketing concept. And in that, we will discuss implementation of the marketing concept. We will try to understand the, what is the role consumer research plays in implementing the marketing concept. And then we will discuss three important strategic tools that are used to implement the marketing concept. And finally, we will discuss the concept of marketing mix And if we have some time left, then we will move to three important concepts like consumer retention, consumer satisfaction, and consumer value as well. So be with me and let's move towards implementing the marketing concept. The widespread adoption of marketing concept in the business industry created the need to understand the consumer in better and better ways. 
it was found out that they need to organize research on professional terms so that they could understand that what are the unsatisfied desires and needs of the consumers. So the field of consumer research organized itself professionally. While the companies started exerting what consumers' wishes and demands are, they found out that to identify consumers' unsatisfied needs is an extremely difficult process as their needs and desires go on changing across different segments of society. For example, people who come from the poor slums, people who come from the middle class categories, or people who come from the elite class categories, all of them want and desire different kinds of products, and they would be attracted to different kinds of product features. Consumer research is basically a collection of methodologies and different tools that are used to study consumer behavior. Now let me show you these two important theoretical perspectives on the slide. Students, as you can see on the slide, that consumer research has two basic areas of application. Number one is positivist approach, and number two is interpretivist approach. Let's discuss positivist approach. Positivist approach is empirical in nature. In positivist approach, we usually gather up quantitative data that helps managers make strategic decisions about launching their products. So let me define the positivist approach for you. As you can see on the slide, studies are conducted to research the causes of behavior that could be generalized to larger populations. Data is collected from a large sample of populations. To understand this concept, let me give you one example. Let's say a car manufacturing company in Pakistan wants to launch a car for the middle class population of Pakistan. But before they actually launch the car and start manufacturing it, they would like to learn a lot of things about their target consumers. For example, they might want to know that what is the total size of the middle class population in this country, how many people are there, so they could collect that data from the statistical censuses available. After they have gathered up this data, they would further want to know that what are the different earning sources for the people of the middle class. Are they doing the jobs or are they running business? Simultaneously, they would like to know that what is the average income of the people in the middle class. After focusing upon these basic, uh, basic information about the consumers, they now want to concentrate upon the feature of their product, which is a car. So they interview a large sample of population on questions like what kind of colors do they like, what kind of basic shapes of the cars do they like, and once you get inside the car, what kind of seating to steering position do they appreciate, what kind of interior and upholstery, the CD players and uh, music system would they prefer? Students, after they gather up all this data, they will find out as to when should they launch the car, how many cars should be pr produced initially, what is the time period in which the car should be launched, what is the basic design and the interior of the car, and all these factors would help them create a demand for their product as well as they would be able to predict that how this demand could be increased over a certain time period. I hope the concept of positivist approach would be clear to you. Now let me cap it up just by saying that you need to remember only two points here which are of extreme importance. While we are professing into the positivist approach, we are concerned with numerical data that is collected from the large sample of population, only then it will be reliable data. And this kind of data helps make companies strategic decisions about their products. Now let's move towards the interpretivist approach. Interpretivist approach is more concerned with quality than with quantity. It is more like I say, I like this product. I like it very much. Or I could simply say, yeah, this is cool. This is okay. That's fine. So over here, the emphasis is upon the quality of the responses that with what intensity consumers come to attribute, come to associate with different attributes of a certain product. So let us define the interpretivist approach. Students, as you can see on the slide, interpretivist approach is qualitative and based upon small samples, searches for common patterns of operative values and meanings across consumption situations. To explain to you the nature of interpretivist approach, let me give you another example. Let's suppose there is a carbonated soft drink company in Pakistan and they want to re-engineer the image of their product in the minds of their consumers. Let's suppose that their target consumers are youngsters between the ages of 18 to 25 years. 
and they find out that youngsters usually have one common behavioral pattern across all different segments of society, which is all of the youngsters would follow opinion leaders. Opinion leaders, again, are the youngsters who are trendsetters, who have the capacity and the quality to lead the crowd somehow. All the youngsters try to imitate the behavior of their opinion leaders. So this company decides to conduct a qualitative research on the opinion leaders. But the first and foremost important issue to be solved is that how to identify opinion leaders from the rest of the crowd. Their marketing research department sits together and they come up with a basic questionnaire that delineates different qualities and characteristics of being an opinion leader. They distribute this questionnaire to a large sample of population amongst the youth and after they get their responses, they score them according to which subject is more closer to the prototype of a young leader that they have defined. Then they identify a few young leaders and they get them on one place to conduct intensive focus group discussions. In this sample, youngsters are collected from all the different segments of society, which means the middle class population, the rich class population, as well as the poor class population. The focus group discussion is focusing upon what these youngsters usually do, how do they spend their day, what kind of colors do they like, what kind of clothes are popular with them, who are their role models, what kind of music do they listen to, what kind of movies do they watch, and what kind of career preferences do they have. After they gather up all of this information, based upon the findings, they come up with a new series of promotional advertisements in which they show youngsters who are opinion leaders and they show them engaging in different kind of excitement oriented activities. And simultaneously, these youngsters are drinking this particular carbonated soft drink. This way, they are trying to associate their drink with youngsters who are opinion leaders and that's how they are trying to get into the minds of the consumers who are ordinary youth. So did you see, students, that qualitative research approach focuses upon the quality of the behaviors, the quality of the responses, and usually such research helps a lot for the companies to pitch their products and position their products in the minds of their consumers. At this point, let me give you a brief review of uh, consumer research. We discussed that consumer research is used to study the consumer behavior and two kinds of approaches are studied. Number one is positivist approach and number two is interpretivist approach. And I hope through the examples you could now decide what kind of research would you use with reference to the particular issue that you are facing in an organization. At this point, let's take our lecture forward and I would like to tell you about what are different strategic tools that are used to implement the marketing concept. The three important strategic tools that are used to implement the marketing concept are something like this. Let me show you the slide. These are segmentation, targeting, and positioning. So let's talk about the segmentation today. The spirit of marketing concept is best in the focus upon consumer. It works on the basic fundamental principle that companies need to understand consumers more and more. However, when they go to study consumers, they find out consumer behavior changes as this is a common observation that consumers come from many different segments, many different cultures, many different socio-cultural backgrounds. They have many different needs. So what is similar amongst them and what kind of consumer behavior are we studying? Suppose if we are launching a certain product, then who are the consumers that we are going to study because consumers are extremely diverse? However, marketing concept keeps into consideration the consumer diversity. And simultaneously, it seeks to find out similarities between different segments of the target consumers. Let me give you a basic example here. Consumers come from many different shapes and sizes. People all over the world have same kinds of biological needs. They need food, shelter, and love and they probably need to be raised up in the family so they could have healthy mind and healthy physical bodies as well and they could act as capable human beings in the society. These needs are fairly common across all cultures in all parts of the world. However, away from the biological needs, certain needs are acquired. For example, what kind of socio-cultural experience 
do I go through, what kind of socio-economic background do I come from, what is my academic background, all these things would start impacting my preferences with reference to the products. Consumer diversity is captured by the concept of marketing. How? Because it is sought to find out different classes of consumers who have similar acquired needs. So let's define the process of segmentation. As you can see on the slide, market segmentation is a process of dividing the markets into subsets of consumers with common needs or characteristics. At this point, to convey the concept of segmentation, let me give you another example. Suppose there is an expensive watches manufacturing company and their target consumers are adults between the ages of 28 years and over. They are manufacturing watches for the people who are coming from the socioeconomic category A, which means they come from the elite rich class. These adults are doing extremely well-paid jobs or they own their own businesses all over the world. Once they study these this class of consumers, they find out that their preferences tend to be sober and graceful and they like decent designs in their watches. So for the last 25 years, this company has been designing watches that are sober, decent and gracefully done. However, after 25 years, in the early part of the 1990s, this company comes to find out that an entirely new class of their consumers is emerging up. Who are these people? The IT industry boom of 1990s created a new class of consumers which were youngsters who were trained in the fields of IT and they were being offered extremely well-paid jobs all over the world. A lot of these IT graduates started owning their own business and certainly the buying capacity of the youngsters had increased like it had never been before. These youngsters were richer than their counterparts ever in the history before. Once they had the buying capacity, this expensive watches manufacturing company decided to target this new class of the consumers as well. So, to engage this new class of consumers, they come up with number one, quantitative research. They find out how many potential consumers are out there all over the world. Number two, qualitative research. They try to find out that what are their preferences in terms of the shapes, colors, and sizes of the watches. And after all this initial research, a new product of the same brand is rolled into the market which will have appeal for this new segment. So did you see that simultaneously this company is now targeting two entirely dif distinct segments. One segment is sober and graceful while the other segment is more colorful, sporty and young. So let's see this process in the figure in the slide. As you can see on the slide, segmentation is grouping consumers by some criteria such that those within a group will respond similarly to a marketing action and those in a different group will respond differently. The first group of figures on the extreme left hand side of the slide that you're watching is all of the expensive watches buyers. And then all of these expensive watches buyers are split up into two distinct categories. Number one is the regular buyers and number two is this new class of consumers which are rich youngsters, adults of 28 years and above. So you see that this expensive watches manufacturing company has divided its consumers according to their buying capacity as well as according to their age groups. So when we are considering dividing our target consumers into different segments, what are those factors that we need to consider? What are the different variables across which the consumers could be divided into different classes. Sometimes this is done according to the gender. There are males and female products. Sometimes this is done by the age. Sometimes this is done by the race, caste or creed. But let me show you on a slide what are the factors that are most often considered while, while classifying the consumers into different segments. Potential segmentation variables are sex, age, race, income, educational level, marital status, number of children, introvert, extrovert, etc., etc. So let's define each of these variables one by one. First of all, gender. Gender is very important. For example, you could easily come to differentiate between the watches that are crafted and designed for the females and the watches that are crafted and designed for the male population. 
Usually there is a huge difference between both kinds of watches as female watches are more delicate, more sophisticated and they are miniature and small. While the male watches are usually bigger, stronger and strong colors are used in these watches. When we come down to the age, we know that kids preferences are entirely different from the teenagers and teenagers preferences are entirely different from the adults. So if a company is catering for the need of all of these three age groups, then they have to come up with an entirely different marketing strategy to target all of these consumers. Let's come down to the education level. We know that education refines us and all of us as we grow up on the ladder of getting more and more education, our choice more and more logical and we are sometimes getting more concerned with the design element also. So the choices and preferences become more refined. So the people who come from the educated class, their preferences might be different from the people who come from a non-educated class. Over here, marital status is also very important. There is a huge difference between the product preferences of the bachelor people and the married people. Bachelor people have to live their life on their own and they are usually thinking about themselves when they go into the market and they purchase different items for themselves. While married people initially there are two people who are living together their life so their product preferences will be based upon sometimes their mutual consent and sometimes they are considering the factor of raising up their own family. The next is number of children. With more children in a family, income is split up in more individuals, which is why the buying power and the buying capacity decreases a bit. Usually families with more children, when they are going into the market and purchasing different products, their preferences are entirely different. At this point, this is also important to note that small families with few children and bigger families with a greater number of children they entirely tend to behave differently when they go and purchase different products or items. Consumers can also be classified on different psychological traits. For example, introverted or extroverted. An introverted person could be the one who is usually shy in the social situations. Such people usually feel uneasy when they are finding themselves amongst a lot of people. And this basic trait of personality impacts the kinds of products that they will choose. For example, an introverted person might not like colors with uh, colors that are flashy. They might not like products that are extremely unique or that will make them stand out from the crowd because they sometimes tend to avoid the individual attention. However, an extroverted person on the other hand is one who is always seeking social contact. Such people usually have more and more friends and they would appreciate different kinds of products that will make them stand out from the rest of the crowd. Preferences change even on different psychological traits that people have by themselves. Then there are other factors that are considered and matter of fact a company can decide upon as many variables as they can think about while they are segmenting their consumers in different classes. Let's move forward to different prerequisites that need to be considered before getting into the process of segmentation. When you decide to get into uh, the process of segmentation, you are possibly thinking of dividing the target consumers into different categories. However, certain prerequisites need to be taken care of. For the start, I would tell you about two most important factors. Number one is, you must always remember that customers' needs are heterogeneous, which means that their needs tend to differ across different segments of the consumers. This also tells you that a particular segment should be distinctly identifiable. Now, if you put the whole thing together, it means that one segment should be particularly identifiable, it should be individual and distinct, and another segment should be totally different from the previous segment. And this can only be done if you understand the basic point that customers' needs tend to differ across different segmentations. At this point, let me give you an example. Suppose you are trying to divide your target consumers with reference to age, and you come up with two distinct categories, which are youngsters between the ages of 18 and 19 years, and youngsters between the ages of 17 and 18 years. Do you see that if there is such a small difference between the ages, then the two categories would not be 
completely distinct from each other. 17 to 18 years are almost the same age as 18 to 19 years. You could have, uh, you could have one segment that is between the ages of 17 onwards to 24 or 25 years because 17 to 18 and 19 to 20 tend to dissolve into each other and there would be no distinction between these two segments of the consumers. Now, when you get into the process of segmentation, you need to ask yourself a few questions. Since we started this uh, subject by asking one basic question and we found out that always questions have been leading us into more questions and the search for the answers to these questions have actually been helping swell the body of consumer psychology and consumer behavior as well. So let me take you to a few more questions that are important considerations while going into the process of segmentation. So those questions could be something like this. Are the segments distinctly identifiable? That means are they distinct, different from each other or are they dissolving into each other? If they are dissolving into each other, then you need to go on to another segment of the consumers and merge both of these dissolving segments into each other. The next is, is my target segment large enough? It should be reasonably large enough so that a company when it gets into manufacturing and all the cost and expenses that this process incurs and then taking the products to the consumers through distribution houses and uh, retail stores and eventually to the end consumer, this is very, very expensive process. And if the target segmentation is very, very small, then there are very little chances that the company will be able to make profit out of that. The next question is, what is the geographical location of your segment? For example, people who live in the mountains are different. Their needs are different from the people who live in the deserts. People who live in the urban areas, their needs and preferences would be different from the people who live in the rural areas. So the segmentation process takes into consideration the demographics also. The next question is, how price sensitive are the individuals? This is a very, very important point because some products that are expensive, they also give a statement that this particular gentleman or lady can actually purchase this brand. And per price is very, very important. If the price is too low, maybe they are not interested in purchasing those products. But if you go down to the middle class, then you will find out that people off and on tend to search for items that not only have quality, but their price is also reasonable. Now that you go into the poor class, you will find out that usually price is the only constraint and efforts are done to purchase the products as cheap as possible. Our next question would be, how competitive is the segment now? Segments tend to grow competitive with reference to the number of products that are available to the consumers in the target market. For example, in Pakistan, over the last 15 to 20 years, if you see different models of the cars, you would see that every brand coming up with a successive model only produced small little changes in their brands. Sometimes the lights of the cars were changed, sometimes certain features were added, a CD player was added, and it was rolled into the market as the next, next model of that particular car. Small little things started making differences because there were very little choices available to the consumers. And market had become extremely competitive, so even a small feature added to a product, to a particular car, would make it a valuable object to be achieved. So if the market is competitive, then the marketing effort also needs to be very, very competitive. And finally, the question is how vulnerable is the target segment to the additional entrants? If you look at the past 20 years, the car consumers of Pakistan had very little choices available to them as every other brand of cars would roll in a new model with slight changes made and they had no other features accessible to them. This made the market vulnerable to the new entrants and new players. They could load new features and give the cars entirely different shape and consumers would have had the acceptability to take this new brand of the cars. Now that we have finished the concept of market segmentation, let's move on to the next topic, which is marketing target. Once the segmentations have been identified, they are accordingly targeted to a proper marketing effort. The important point here is that marketing effort or the marketing actions will entirely change with reference to a particular segment targeted. 
So let's first define the process of marketing, market targeting, which is, as you can see on the slide, selecting one or more of the segments identified for the company to pursue. So students, as I told you earlier, the market effort and the marketing action changes with reference to a particular segment that is being targeted. Important point here is that how the marketing action would change with reference to a particular market. Now let me show you this process on a slide. As you can see on the slide, if we are doing the mass marketing, then the entire market is our market. Can you think of a product that is getting its consumer from the entire market, regardless of their cost and creed, ages, socioeconomic backgrounds, as well as the academic backgrounds? Something is coming to your mind? Yes, I can see. I can feel. I think carbonated soft drinks are targeted equally across all all different markets, regardless of their age, their socioeconomic backgrounds, or their sociocultural backgrounds, all of us consume soft drinks, carbonated soft drinks. Differentiated marketing is another type of marketing which takes into consideration more than one segment of the consumers. And as you can see on the slide, in this uh, instance of differentiated marketing, three types of consumers are identified. So students, so far we have discussed market segmentation and market targeting. Now comes the third most important part, which is called market positioning. This is the third important strategic tool of implementing the marketing concept. But before I tell you about this concept any further, let me start once again with a small exercise to all of you. Do you have your pens and papers handy in front of you? Are you ready? Or do you want me to give you some more time? Okay, all am I going to do is to speak a few statements and all I require from you is to write down what product or brand name comes to your mind. But don't tell me because we cannot use the brand names in our lectures. Are you ready? Okay, so let's go on towards the first statement. The first statement is a red colored cold drink of summer. Is something coming to your mind? Yeah, good. Write it down. The next is a cricketer drinking a cola drink from a bottle. Yeah, you are thinking about something. The third one is cough in the cold. Sadio Mekansi. The fourth one is a detergent powder. And the fifth one is a whitening cream. I am sure you must have more than five different brand names of different products. Yes. This was to pitch in the concept of positioning. Now let me define the concept of positioning formally to you. Let's go on the slide. Positioning is developing a distinct image for the product or service in the mind of the consumer. The image that will differentiate the offering from the competing ones. Students, positioning is the place that, it, that a certain product occupies in the mind of the consumer. This is typically defined by the consumers on the basis of a product's important attributes. For example, let's say a gentleman wants to start a fast food restaurant. He's, doing, he's been doing a lot of ambitious thinking in making the basic plans of his uh, fast food restaurant. And he thinks that after one restaurant is successful, then he would replicate the same restaurant over different parts of the city and eventually they will become a national food chain and finally they will become an international food chain. Well, this is a wonderful idea and I can see that this is very, very ambitious, but let's see what is their marketing strategy. In their marketing strategy, they think about their product as neat, clean and healthy food. And that's how they come up with their product designs, product packaging, as well as promotional advertisements, which are all concentrating over three elements which are healthy, tasty, and nourishing food. They are into business for the next six months and eventually they find out that they are not getting the right market share. What went wrong? They sit together and start considering what are the different factors and certainly a question pops up in their mind, which is, what is actually fast food? And the answer that pops in their mind is that fast food is something fast. But why do we need fast food? because we are living in a very busy and hectic lifestyle and we need the means to come and meet with us that we can finish off in about 5, 10 or 15 minutes because we do not have the time for elaborate dinners and lunches. Is that right? This was a moment of insight. Understanding that people don't actually need the food to finish off their meals but people actually need food that is going to solve their problem. 
and their problem is quite elaborate and complicated. These are the days when one person is simultaneously doing many different jobs. So in one day, they are sometimes doing two or maybe three different jobs. Students study in the morning and in the evenings, they also do their jobs. So one person on the average is more busy than an average person, say about 20 to 25 years ago. Because we are so busy and the lifestyle is so hectic, we need to have the solution to this problem. And this food is not just food, this is a solution to the problem of finding time and having food in about 15 to 20 minutes while the food is not only tasty, healthy, it's also nourishing. So the food meeting with a busy lifestyle and helping people solve their problem. Based upon this kind of thinking, they come up with an entirely new series of promotional advertisements and their flyers are focusing upon the people who are going through their busy, hectic schedules and they just get the time to enjoy this food and that food is also very, very nourishing for them. Now let's move forward to different uh, factors that could be uh, considered while choosing a positioning strategy. There are different uh, ways to choose a positioning strategy, but uh, first of all, just like we uh, saw in the example that people sat together and they started thinking that what went wrong, and this question led them to think that what are actually the competitive advantages of their food. And they found out that the competitive advantages with their food was not just taste, health and nourishment, but also a solution to the problem. So once they had a list of the competitive advantages, they started narrowing down on few of them. After narrowing down on few of them, which was uh, the solution to a problem as well as tasty, healthy and nourishing food, they, they uh, decided to take these points into their promotion and advertisement strategies. So in the second step, you choose the right competitive advantages that need to be marketed thoroughly. These are the points on which consumers is going to think about your product in positive or negative way. This is actually the image that exists in the mind of the consumer about your product. While going into the process of positioning and utilizing from this tool, there is uh, a particular criteria that you could utilize from for your own sake. But you could expand this criteria, you could shorten this criteria, it all depends upon the kind of product that is being launched and what kind of particular segment is being targeted. However, some important features of this criteria could be something like you must start thinking how important is your product to a particular set of consumers. Like, does it help solve the problems? And if it helps solve the problems, then can those problems be solved without the usage of your product? If that cannot be solved, then your product is really, really important. The second criteria is how superior is your product? from the rest of the competitors. What kind of additional services are being provided along with your product which are additionally helping solve a particular problem? Then is your product preemptive in nature? Which means that once your product is launched in the market, it just wipes off all the rest of the competitors because you were able to have certain features in this product that solve the problem, not like better than any other product in the market. The next one is how distinctive is your product? How unique is your product? What is its packaging? What kind of colors are being used? And how do you create a distinct impression and image of your product? Then are you communicating the right kind of competitive advantages? That means are those competitive advantages being communicated properly to the target audience? Then finally there are things like is the product affordable or is the product profitable? So all these factors are considered while defining a positioning strategy for a product. Now let me show you these factors on a slide as well for your review. The positioning criteria for meaningful differences that we just discussed are important, superior, preemptive, distinctive, communicable, affordable, and profitable. Now, at this point, students, it is important to remember that positioning can also be done across many dimensions of different attributes. A small line of uh, different uh, dimensions can be figured out something like this. Number one is different attributes of the product, the effects of the product, 
the users, what kind of people use this product, the usage of this product, and relationship of this product with other products. Now let's discuss these factors one by one. For example, when we talk about the attributes, this is different features and different qualities of a particular product. And these are the defining features of the product which are uh, encarved into the minds of the consumers. For example, these days you might have seen an advertisement about, let's say, an XYZ product which is uh, portrayed as a very, very expensive look looking product, but the main attribute of this product is that this is, in fact, very, very cheap. You see, we can, uh, we can talk about this factor as a price factor also, but I am particularly referring you to this example to consider it and conceive it in terms of the attributes because the attribute of this product is that this looks expensive, but this is actually cheap. And that's why there is an appeal amongst the consumers for this product. The next is effects. For example, what comes to your mind when I say skin whitening cream? Every time we want to position a particular uh, product with reference to its effects, a better strategy usually is to show people before using a particular product and after using a particular product. And the series of advertisements that we come across on different media that are about skin whitening creams usually show people prior to using this cream and after using this cream and the impacts that take place on the radiance and uh, the fairness of their skin. Usually, this is projected through showing a problem which this particular cream is actually solving. Price could be another factor along which a product could be positioned. For example, some products are priced as very expensive. There are some other products which are priced as very, very cheap. If the product is priced as very, very expensive, then Purchasing this product also tells us something about the consumer, that this particular gentleman or lady has the capacity to purchase this particular brand, which is an appreciable factor for the consumer to raise his interest into purchasing that product. However, there are certain products that are pitched in as cheap products. You might have come across advertisements on the television in which uh, a particular kind of product is shown in com competition with other similar products, but the bottom line of the advertisement is that why do you pay so much money to purchase the same product inside which we are giving you in a very cheaper quantity? The next factor was user. Usually the cigarette ads use, uh, use this kind of positioning quite a lot in which a cigarette smoker is shown living a very adventurous and pompous lifestyle and uh, at the final uh, cut of the advertisement, this gentleman is shown smoking a particular brand of cigarette. This advertisement is uh, trying to take the benefit of showing a particular user using a particular product. And that's how they are trying to create appeal amongst their target consumers. Final is usage. Products could also be pitched into the minds of consumers with reference to their usage. There are so many different products that we use quite a lot, and I am talking about the frequency here. But there are certain other products that have been using, that we have been using for quite a long, long time. Maybe our parents, our elder brothers or sisters, or some elderly people introduced us to those products, but we are still hooked on, on to using, going on using these products over and over again, over a very long time period. For example, when I speak the word detergent powder, what comes to your mind? Or when I speak the word shoe polish, what comes to your mind? I'm sure there are certain brands that are coming to your mind, and there is a possibility that you might have been using these brands for quite a long time now. The next uh, factor on which a product would be positioned is a product's uh, relation to other products. Over here, I might give you the example of a car shoe polish. Every time we think about a car shoe polish, we also think about a glossy, shining car in the perspective. So we think about a car shoe polish in perspective and in relationship with a shining glossy car as well. However, an important factor over here is to notice that how this product relates to its competitors also. So you might have come across a series of advertisements on the television channels in which different brands come to compete with each other and uh, in a very unwitting and silent fashion, they tend to criticize each other. 
Students, this was the end of the concept of market positioning. Now let me give you a brief review of what we discussed in, the, uh, in this lecture today. We started out our lecture today with implementation of marketing concept and we discussed three strategic tools for implementing the marketing concept which were market segmentation, market targeting and market positioning. Now let me show you all of these three tools on one slide for the review purpose. As you can see, the steps in marketing usually involve number one is market segmentation where we identify basis for segmenting the market and develop different segment profiles. Number two is market targeting where we develop measure of segment attractiveness and select the target segments. And finally market positioning where we develop positioning for target segments and develop a marketing mix for each segment. Students, I leave you with this here today. And in the next lecture, we will discuss marketing mix and three other important concepts, which are consumer retention, consumer value, and consumer satisfaction. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you very much. And take care of yourself as well as your friends, neighbors, and relatives. Good luck to all of you. Allah Hafiz.